Well, let me, uh, let me start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of your precious Son, uh, about whom we've already sung, uh, whose, whose work we have celebrated, and because of whose work we are all here this morning, in his name, Lord, I, I come to you and I ask that you would take this time of the preaching of your word and that you would bless it, Lord. I, I pray that your spirit would press upon the hearts of the hearers, that all of us would be renewed in our faith in you, in our love for you. I pray, Lord, for anyone in this room that doesn't know you, that you would convict them of their sin and of the beautiful and glorious salvation that you offer. Thank you for the privilege, Lord, of gathering here in your name. Thank you so much for loving us <clears throat> faithfully and forever. In your holy name, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, today, for those of you who are new or, or just visiting, uh, we're in the middle of a sermon series called The Upper Room. I think it's called The Upper Room. Yes, The Upper Room. I couldn't remember if it had the the on there or not. Uh, I've been paying attention, seriously. Uh, it's called The Upper Room. We're preaching through uh, several chapters in the latter part of the Gospel of John. And we began in chapter 13, which was located in the Upper Room, where Jesus shared his last supper with his apostles. Uh, that's the name of the, uh, of the series. If you haven't already turned there in your Bibles, go ahead and do so. John 16, starting in verse 16. <clears throat> One of the things that, uh, this is just a, a little bit of an aside, there'll be no charge for this. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about as I was sitting over there also, because uh, I don't know if the other guys that preach experience this or not, but as the, in the moments leading up to, okay, you're about to go on stage, there's always this thought about, okay, how do I break the ice? How do I even start this? Because it, it just feels, to me, it always feels awkward. And I realized that over the past 15 years that I've been in this church that I usually start off by talking about the weather. And so I was like, okay, don't talk about the weather every time. It's, it's just a... <laughs> Stop doing that. Uh, so I don't know if I did any better by not talking about the weather, but, but here we are. I uh, just wanted to give you a peek into my mind. <laughs> well, uh, I want you guys to think back for a minute. Think back to when you were just a little tyke, the early part of World War II. <laughs> I know most of you weren't born then. I'm kidding. <clears throat> In the early part of World War II, General Douglas MacArthur was stationed in the Philippines where he was overseeing the defense of the Philippines against the uh, approaching Japanese army. And uh, as time went by, the Japanese army was very successful against the Filipino army that General MacArthur was overseeing and had been training. And so the Japanese began advancing, taking over island after island. And it came to the point that in, uh, when was it, early 1942, <clears throat> pardon me, he was ordered by President Roosevelt to leave the island because they were just about surrounded by the Japanese. The Japanese were going to overrun it, and he ordered him to leave. And so MacArthur did so very reluctantly. Uh, but before he did that, he made a promise. What did he say? That's right, I shall return. He promised, I shall return. And then about two and a half years later, General MacArthur walked onto a beach in the Philippines, leading an army to liberate the islands from Japanese occupation. And in a speech that day that was broadcast on their national radio, he said... I have returned. That's right. Very good. Some of you war buffs know about that. That MacArthur's promise and later fulfillment is one of the most dramatic examples of a fulfilled promise that we have in history because it, was, it took place over such a long period of time. There was war in between. And all those two and a half years, MacArthur was constantly uh, pressing the president to send him back to, to free these people that he had had to abandon, the troops and the, uh, the Filipino people. <clears throat> and eventually, of course, he was allowed to do just that. Now, in the passage that we're looking at today, which, which Gary just so ably read a few minutes ago, Jesus makes some promises also. And in fact, one of his promises is about a similar thing, because he says that he is going to leave and that he's going to come once again. So uh, before I... Well, let, let me give you a bit of a roadmap. Here's what I'm going to do this morning. First thing I want to do is talk about the basic story that we find in these nine verses it's a, a story within a story, I recognize, but there's a little bit of an interchange that happens I want to go over. And then after that, I'm going to drill into what I think is the dominating theme of this passage. Uh, well, I won't tell you what that is. We'll get there. <clears throat> the, the title of the sermon gave it away anyway. Uh, so let's look at the story. Uh, 
I break this mini story into two parts. There's a prophecy that's given by Jesus and uh, some reaction to that. And then Jesus gives a, an explanation of that prophecy, although he actually only gives a partial explanation, as we'll see when we get into it. So in the first part, Jesus gives a prophecy to his apostles. Look with me again at verses 16 to 18. A little while and you will see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Well, by the time we get to verse 16, Jesus has already referred to leaving them about 12 times Starting in the upper room, he'd said things like, where I'm going, you can't follow. I go and prepare a place for you. I'm going away. Uh, it's necessary that I go to the Father. And he had also mentioned six or seven times to them that he was going to come back. He said things like, I will come again. I will come to you. You will see me. <clears throat> now, if you'll recall from several weeks back, uh, which... If you recall from several weeks back, one of the things I established was that we don't usually recall things from several weeks back. But if you do, if you're one of those people, uh, you'll remember that some of the times that Jesus was talking about the disciples seeing him again, he was actually talking about their uh, seeing him spiritually through the presence of the Spirit in their lives. But some of the other times he was talking about them physically seeing him again. So this idea was not new to them that Jesus was going to leave and then Jesus was going to come back. The disciples didn't exactly understand what that meant, but they at least had heard that message over and over. Well, in verse 16, Jesus comes back to this leaving and coming again with this kind of a strange cryptic prophecy. A little while and you will not see me, a little while and you will see me. Now let's concede for the sake of the apostles that that's kind of difficult to understand. I mean, that statement just laying there, verse 16, all by itself, I don't think any of us would naturally go, oh, okay, I see what you're saying by that. So it makes sense that they, they didn't really understand what he was talking about. <clears throat> so then uh, the story moves on, and they start talking about it amongst themselves. I find this real interesting that uh, nobody wanted to ask Jesus directly and say, what do you mean by that? And I don't know exactly why. Of course, the text doesn't go into that. All I can do is speculate, but I know... Back in chapter 14, at one point, Jesus was talking about the Father, showing them the Father. And Philip spoke up and said, Lord, show us the Father. You know, Philip was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that I'm listening here. And then Jesus said, Philip, where have you been? <laughs> so Philip probably shrank back into the shadows like, okay, I'm not going to ask any more questions. So for some reason, they were a little bit afraid to ask a question. And, and so they just started talking amongst themselves. And how many of you have ever been among a group of people... And you're discussing something none of you really understands. <laughs> we all have, right? <laughs> discussing something none of you understands. Where, where do you get? What conclusion do you get to? Basically the same conclusion the apostles did. You know, we just pulled our ignorance and we still didn't come up with anything. All we have is questions. I don't understand what he's talking about. So whatever the reason, like I said, they didn't want to talk to him. So they just start talking among themselves. No, we don't know. We, that was their conclusion. We don't know what he's talking about. That's our conclusion. Uh, so then, <clears throat> excuse me. Where was I going with that? Oh, yes. <laughs> However, let me give them this. Okay, here, I do want to concede another point to the apostles. In their question, they said, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you won't see me. A little while, and you won't see me. And then they added, and because I am going to the Father. So they were connecting some of the dots. Because earlier in the previous section, Jesus had mentioned that he was going away to the Father. And that was when he said it was necessary to go to the Father so that the Spirit could then be sent to the, uh, to the church. So the apostles at least are starting to connect multiple things that he's saying. Okay, he's saying a little while, and he's saying he's going to the Father, so that's somehow connected. And then they also notice that this phrase, little while, keeps popping up. A little while, you will see me. Excuse me, a little while, you won't see me. A little while, you will see me. And in this upper room discourse, he'd actually mentioned that, <clears throat> excuse me, that phrase a couple other times. Uh, verse 33 of chapter 13, he said... Yet a little while I am with you. And then in 14, 19, he said,
Jesus explains, they will, but it will turn to joy. <clears throat> Look at verses 19 and 20. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while, you won't see me a little while and you will see me. Now Jesus, because he was supernaturally perceptive, knew that that's what they were talking about. And he also knew that they were, for whatever reason, hesitant to ask him. And so he very tenderly just approaches them and says, hey, is this what you guys are talking about? And notice the rest of the passage, he doesn't follow up with, are you so blind or where is your faith or any kind of corrective statement. He just says, let me help you understand this a little bit better. So then he explains the prophecy further, but like I mentioned earlier, it's really just a partial explanation because he still doesn't get into specifics. He still doesn't get into enough detail to go, oh, I know exactly what you're saying there. Now, as you'll see in just a little bit where we're standing on the other side of the cross and the resurrection and the ascension and all those events of the New Testament, we can put that together. But where they were standing, Jesus is still living. The crucifixion hasn't happened. This is just a big mystery. So here was Jesus' first explanation. Okay, is this what you guys were wondering about? And then he says this in verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, <clears throat> but your sorrow will turn into joy. Now that doesn't fully explain the prophecy, but it does give them a hint. Because now he's saying, okay, let me tell you what's going to happen emotionally you're going to have a time of weeping while the world, meaning all these powers, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, the Romans, all of these world powers that are opposed to me, they're going to rejoice. So whether or not they put that together at the moment, it surely at least intimated to them, okay, this is going to be something pretty serious. And perhaps some of them could have at least had the thought, man, I wonder if he's talking about dying. <clears throat> uh my, by the way, I meant to say this earlier as well. The uh, toner was out in the color, color printer, so I have only black and white to look at. And I usually use these large bars of color to know where I am. So that's why I keep looking down going, uh. I don't want you to... Because <laughs> my colors aren't there. Looking for color. Uh, so where was I? Oh, yeah. Okay, so... He said, you're going to weep and the world's going to rejoice. So he gives them a hint. Okay, this is what is going to happen. When I say I'm going away, you're not going to see me. And then you will see me. This not going to see you. It's going to cause you to weep and it's going to cause the world to rejoice. So this is something big. And I, as I, again, I say, I think that the apostles were probably starting to get the idea that maybe he was talking about his death. Now, I think that the best way to understand that prophecy a little while and you won't see me a little while and you will see me is this. The first little while, the first micron, is referring to the time between Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection. So for a little while, three days, they didn't see him. And then the second little while is the time after his resurrection and before his ascension. So there was another little while where they did see him. So another way to translate it would be this. For a little while, you will see me no longer. And again, for a little while, you will see me. The first little while began when Jesus was crucified. The disciples wept and the world, the religious leaders in Israel, the Roman officials, the world rejoiced. He's gone. He's out of our hair, no longer causing us trouble, no longer stirring up the people. <clears throat> the disciples were experiencing deep sorrow, of course. And then this second little while began on Easter morning when Christ rose from the dead and they saw that he was alive and they experienced the joy of I see Jesus again. He's alive. He is not dead. He is who he said he is. The sorrow of his followers turned to joy because he was alive. Now, to help them understand this, that the path to joy sometimes requires sorrow, he gives them this interesting uh, illustration of a woman giving birth to a child. <clears throat> Look at verses 21 and 22 again. When a woman is giving birth... She has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. A woman in labor has sorrow from the pain involved. Now there was a, I remember reading years ago, and women, you can, you can tell me whether this is true or not. 
<clears throat> all you women that have, that have gone through this uh, childbirth process, years ago, and they said that what a woman experiences during labor is actually not pain, it's just pressure. And I think that's, <laughs> I think that's hogwash. <laughs> Because that's similar to saying, really, a tornado is just wind. Just not that's right. <clears throat> Women do have great sorrow when they're giving birth because of that, that pain that's involved. But as soon as the baby is born, as soon as the doctor brings the baby up to see, uh, to, to, to show to the mother, there's this flood of joy and happiness that swallows up that sorrow that they felt. So they're not immediately going, man, I could go through that again tomorrow. But... <clears throat> no longer is sorrow what's at the forefront of their mind. Now it's joy. Joy is all they can think about. This beautiful, glorious little baby that, that has grown inside me and is now delivered into the world. <clears throat> so Jesus is not saying that a woman actually forgets the pain of labor, but that it's no longer at the forefront. It's no longer on her mind. It's no longer what she's focused on. It's the joy of this newborn baby. And in the same way, he's saying, disciples, this is what's going to happen for you. You're going to experience the deepest sorrow of your life because I'm going to be taken away. And of course, as we know, he would be brutally killed and crucified, brutally beaten and crucified. But then when I come back, when you see me again, joy is going to swallow up that sorrow. You won't forget what happened. You won't forget that you had that sadness, but it will no longer be at the forefront of your mind. It'll no longer be at the top of your consciousness. It'll be swallowed up and taken over by the joy that you're going to experience. <clears throat> this section of Jesus' discourse ends with a, a word about prayer, verses 23 and 24. Uh, now he looks forward even farther. Okay, so he's been talking about the crucifixion time, the resurrection time, the time he spends with them. And now he looks forward to a time when truly he would not be with them physically any longer. Because he says, in that day, you will ask nothing of me. Meaning, again, they wouldn't have understood it at the time, but what he's telling them is, there is going to come a time when physically I will be gone from you. That you won't be, I won't be around for you to ask me any questions. And that day you will ask me nothing. And so then he points them to where they do need to be asking. He said, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Since they had met Jesus and been with him these past three years, he had been with them to answer questions, to give instruction, guidance, comfort, encouragement. But he's telling them that time is coming to an end. So point your questions, point your requests to the Father. Ask the Father in the name of Jesus, on the authority of Jesus, on the merit of Jesus. And he promises that the Father will give them what they ask. And I'll talk more about that later. So this is the basic story. There's a prophecy that Jesus gives, confuses the disciples, and then Jesus responds by explaining a little bit farther to help them at least emotionally deal with what he had prophesied. So now I want to focus your attention on the dominant theme that's brought out at the end of this passage, and that is the theme of joy. <clears throat> I want to talk for a few minutes about characteristics of joy in Christ. And I want to emphasize that what I'm talking about is joy in Christ, joy that is based upon, focused upon, derived from Christ. The reason I emphasize that is because people outside of Christ can experience joy as well. But the only way to experience Christ's joy is to be in Christ, to be a believer, to put your faith in him. The Greek word that is translated joy is, is kara, which is where Kara Kerfman's name came from, I assume. Uh, and she's a joyful person, so that fits. <clears throat> and it simply means joy. They translated it right on. There was just nowhere else they could go. It just means joy, which of course means gladness or happiness. Joy is an emotion. We can feel joy. We can experience it. It can happen spontaneously when something good happens to us. But it's also a state of being or a state of mind. You can have joy in your marriage even though you're not always feeling joy throughout your marriage. You can have joy in your children even though you're not always feeling joy all the time with your children. You can have joy in your job, maybe, but uh, <laughs> even if you're not always feeling that joy. So let's return to the passage in John, and I want to look at these characteristics of joy in Christ. The first one is this. Joy comes from beholding Christ. Joy comes from beholding Christ. It is seeing Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord of all, that is the, that is the source of joy for believers. In verse 16, Jesus said, 
you will see me no longer and you will see me. And then in verse 20, he says, you will be sorrowful and your sorrow will turn to joy. So the reason I color coded these phrases is because the see me no longer corresponds to sorrowful and the you will see me corresponds to joy. And then in verse 22, he says, I'll see you again <clears throat> and you'll rejoice. Your hearts will rejoice. Not seeing Jesus is what caused the disciples their greatest sorrow and sadness. Because they had bonded to him. He was their greatest friend. He was their long-awaited Messiah. He was their Savior. He was the Son of God. He was the greatest person that ever walked this earth. They loved him beyond any other. They were willing to part with their families in order to spend time with him. Because he was the greatest, the, the, the one that all of their affections were focused on. And when he was taken away, crucified and buried... They experienced deep sadness. But when he returned to them, after his resurrection, they experienced overwhelming joy. John 20, 20 says the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Their joy came from beholding Christ. Now, the disciples could physically look at Jesus. They could behold him with their physical eyes. But we don't have that blessing yet. No, none of us can look at Jesus physically. He is not physically here on the earth for us to look at, because we know that 40 days after his resurrection, he physically rose from the earth <clears throat> to return to heaven. But believers can still behold Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.8 says, And we all, speaking of believers, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, speaking of Jesus, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God shines in our hearts the light of knowledge, the light of the knowledge of who Jesus is. He gives us the knowledge of the glory of Jesus Christ, which enables us to see his face. But how do we see his face? How, I'm sorry if I got shadows on the screen. How do we behold Jesus? Because we can't behold him physically. We behold him spiritually with the eyes of faith. What I'm talking about is giving your attention and your affection to Jesus. We behold Jesus when we meditate on his attributes. His greatness, his humility, his patience, his selflessness, his purity. We behold Jesus when we give him praise. When you're praising Jesus, you're focusing on him. You're renewing your love for him. You're expressing your love for him. And it is Jesus that is now at the forefront of your mind and at the top of your consciousness. Joy comes from beholding Jesus. And that is a blessing that is given to every believer. We can behold him with the eyes of faith. Joy comes from beholding Christ. And Jesus Christ is the ground of the believer's joy. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9 says this, Though you have not seen him physically, you love him. Though you do not now see him physically, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now, Peter was writing to people like us that had never seen Jesus in the flesh. And he was saying that even though you don't see him physically, you can still rejoice in him. You can still behold his glory. You can still, by faith, see Jesus for who he is. You behold his goodness, his kindness, his love, and you rejoice. Joy comes from beholding Christ. The second characteristic of joy in Christ is this. Joy cannot be taken away. Look at verse 22 again. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Now the joy that the followers of Jesus experienced on that resurrection day was that he was alive. So now they knew beyond the shadow of a doubt he was the Messiah. He was the Son of God who could even conquer death. He had paid for their sins and risen again, showing that his sacrifice had been accepted for the, for, by the Father. Showing that he was now the Lord of the church, that he was the Lord of all, that he was their great uh, and awesome king and would be with them forever. <clears throat> he talked with them. He let them touch him. He ate food with them. He cooked food for them. And this was over a period of six weeks. Acts 1 says that he showed them himself alive by many proofs. So he made sure that they were 100% confident that he was alive and that he was well. 
His resurrection proved everything that he had said about him. And therefore, they could know that their sins were forgiven. <clears throat> they could know that he saves, and that could never be taken away from them. Why? Because no one could change the fact of the resurrection. No one could change that historical truth that Jesus had lived, that he was crucified, that he was buried, and now that he had risen again. I'm going to give you guys a trivial example to go from the sublime uh, to the ridiculous. Since 1989, my favorite sports team has been... That's right. I knew they knew it over here. The Dallas Cowboys, my favorite sports team. <clears throat> uh, in the early 1990s, for those of you who can remember back that far, the Cowboys won three Super Bowls. Three Super Bowls. Three Super Bowls. And I got to watch those three Super Bowls. I got to experience the joy of my team winning the Super Bowl, my team being the champions. And that still gives me joy. Because no matter what happens going forward, as you know, in the ensuing 23 years, stop, it's not funny. In the ensuing 23 years, in the ensuing 23 years, you know, they have not, not only have they not won a Super Bowl, they haven't been to a Super Bowl, but I can still draw joy from that fact that cannot be changed. <laughs> it cannot be changed that the Cowboys won those Super Bowls while they were my favorite team. And so the same way with the disciples, okay? The ones that saw Jesus and experienced that joy, regardless of the fact that he later rose into heaven, not to be seen physically by them again, regardless of what persecutions they faced, regardless of what hardships they faced, nothing could change the fact that Jesus had risen again. Jesus was alive, and that would always be true. And that's why he said, no one will take your joy from you. <clears throat> not persecution, exile, hatred, or mockery. But what about us? What about us followers of Jesus that never saw him in the flesh, that didn't witness his resurrection? Can our joy be taken away? Well, no, our joy can't be taken away because our joy has the exact same basis as their joy, that Jesus is alive, that he is the Savior, that he does forgive us of our sins, that he has reconciled us to God, that he has given us the, the uh, privilege of being uh, adopted into the family of God, we still rejoice in knowing that Jesus is who he said he is and did what he said he would do. And that can't be taken away. Now, you may be sitting here thinking this morning, <clears throat> Slade, that is not true. My joy has been taken away. I haven't experienced joy in weeks or months or possibly even years. Don't tell me that joy can't be taken away. Don't give me that Pollyanna view of the world. My joy was taken away, and it hasn't come back. Maybe you suffer from a chronic illness that keeps you in pain. Maybe you suffered a tragic loss. Maybe your job doesn't pay enough, and you're constantly feeling the pressure of debts and bills that you can't keep up with. Maybe you're struggling with the constant weight of shame over some sinful habit that you can't seem to break. <clears throat> I recognize that we don't always feel the joy of the Lord. I recognize that joy can be buried under sadness or anger or shame or regret or a hundred other things. But I still say that if you are a believer, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, then your joy has not been taken away. Because the source of your joy is who Jesus is and what he has done for you. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your pain, you can still rejoice in Christ. The reason this past, uh, excuse me, this message was called the depths of joy, uh, Kathy Silvertooth actually suggested that to me, is this, no matter what you experience, the deepest part of who you are, your core identity, which is now a child of God, <clears throat> can rejoice in who Christ is and what he has done. Even when the surface of your life is nothing but chaos and pain, in the deep place of your spirit, you can still rejoice in Christ. You can still rejoice in the fact that Jesus is alive and that he has forgiven you and you are his forever. In 2 Corinthians 6, Paul, <clears throat> the apostle, described some of the things that he went through. Beatings, imprisonments, sleepless nights, hunger, but he described him and his companions this way, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. 
So the Bible knows that real life is going to batter you. The Bible knows that you're going to face pains that you cannot deal with and you can't, that you can't simply just put to the side. The Bible knows that you're going to experience things that do cause your joy to get buried down. But God is telling you that your joy is based on Jesus Christ and he doesn't change. What he has done will never change. Who he is will never change. And so you can still rejoice in him even in the midst of your sorrow. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18 says this, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. And the fig tree he's painted so far is this, I'm impoverished, and I don't have any visible hope of that changing. I have nothing. But he goes on to say this, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk would not have felt joy in that situation, but he could still choose to rejoice in who God is and what God has done. So if it seems like you're light years from the joy of the Lord, listen to Habakkuk. Choose to rejoice in Christ. Choose to take joy in the God of your salvation. Praise him for forgiving your sins. Praise him for giving you the right to become a child of God. Praise him for giving you his righteousness. Scholar J.R. Thompson said this, Our religion, the Christian religion, teaches us to look away from ourselves to God to rest on his declarations, his faithfulness, his love. Your life situation may only be grounds for sadness and despair, but don't put all your focus on your life situation. Look away from you and look to Christ Jesus, what he has done, who he is, what he has declared, his faithfulness and his love that can't change. The last thing about joy that I want to mention is this. Joy is stirred up by answered prayer. Look at verses 23 and 24 again. At the end of verse 23, he says, Whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And at the end of verse 24, he says, Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Joy in Christ is based on the person and work of Christ. He's the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose from the dead. These are the bedrock truths of our faith. And on top of that, your experience of that joy is aided by seeing God answer your prayers. Now, you remember that I mentioned that you should look to Jesus when joy gets pushed down by the storms of life. Here is another way to experience God's joy, regardless of your circumstances. And that is seeing God answer your prayer, receiving from the Father what you have asked from him. Jesus said, your joy will be full as you receive what you ask for in my name. Now, he gives this wonderfully broad promise. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. In John chapter 14, he said almost the exact same thing. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. Now, if you can remember way back to early February, our uh, lead pastor, Todd Malone, was preaching through John chapter 14, and he came across this very promise. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. And he explained that praying in the name of Jesus means praying to further Jesus' reputation and to accomplish his plans. Praying in Jesus' name is a way of saying that we're willing to submit our requests to his infinite goodness and wisdom. You may ask the Father in the name of Jesus to give you the job that you just applied for, and you may not get the job. But if you don't, you can rest in the knowledge that you're not getting in, that you, let me start that over. If you don't, you can rest in the knowledge that not getting that job will further the plans that Jesus has for your life. So please don't get the idea that this is some blank check that Jesus has given us and we can just write the amount that we want. Praying in his name necessarily limits our prayer to prayers that are uh, consistent with who Jesus is. But here I am talking about why God may not answer your prayer. And what Jesus just said is, your joy is full because God does answer your prayer. You experience joy by praying things that do get answered. So how do you experience that? How do you experience prayers They get answered by the Father that fill your joy. Well, you have to give sacrificially to the church. No, I'm kidding. kidding. It's not true. That is totally not true. You experience that by praying. 
You experience it by praying, especially for that which you know is consistent with the plans and reputation of Jesus. Pray for God to give wisdom to the elders of FBC as they shepherd our congregation. Pray for God to save an unsaved friend or relative. Pray for God to give humility to the arrogant. Pray for God to give you the ability to show his powerful love to the unlovable. Jesus promised that the Father would give us what we ask in his name. And as we see those prayers answered, our joy will be full. Throughout the New Testament, very often when Paul would start a letter, he would say to the church that he was writing to, I've been praying for you. And whenever you look at those prayers of Paul... He never prayed for the circumstances of those people to change. He never prayed for a new job. He never prayed that uh, they would beca- to get more money. He never prayed for things to go easy with them. What did he pray? That God would strengthen you in the inner man. That God would give you patience. That you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. That you would be able to stand when the evil day comes. That you would be able to be faithful. That your faith would grow. That your love would abound in knowledge. He was praying about things that he knew were consistent with the plans and reputation of Jesus Christ. And so he saw those prayers answered. Joy comes from beholding Christ. Joy cannot be taken away. And joy is stirred up by answered prayer. Here's the point. Jesus gives invincible joy to his people. The joy that Jesus gives is invincible because it is based on him. And he cannot change. He cannot be defeated. He cannot be shaken. He cannot be overcome. Joy that comes from experiencing the risen Lord is joy that cannot be taken away. You may feel defeated. You may feel despair. You may feel crushing sadness. Look to Jesus and rejoice in him anyway. Take joy in Jesus. If you're in the valley of the shadow of death, you can still have the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. That he is your salvation. That your sins are are forgiven, that you are part of his family forever, that you are accepted by the Father and beloved, and that you have an eternal inheritance waiting for you. 18th century pastor John Gill wrote this, To see the glory and beauty of Christ's person, the fullness and suitableness of him as a Savior, must fill the heart of a believer with joy unspeakable. Exactly what Peter was talking about. Anglican vicar J. Gwen Thomas wrote this, The road to true joy is to see that we have strong, reasonable, and spiritual grounds for rejoicing, and that such joy be always linked with its source and object. Nehemiah 8.10, of course, says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. Jesus gives invincible joy to his people. May God help us. To live in that joy. Let's think for just a few minutes about some responses to this truth uh, that we can have. First, praise the Lord for the joy of knowing that he's alive and that he's your savior. If you are a believer, then the spirit of God, the divine spirit of God lives in you. And he testifies to your spirit that Jesus is alive. And he testifies to your spirit that you are a child of God. He testifies that Jesus is an all-sufficient Savior. He makes Jesus real to you and brings you into communion with the risen Lord. Praise Jesus for that. Even when you're not feeling it, praise him anyway, especially when you're not feeling it. Second response, if you're struggling with a lack of joy, and if we're honest, every person in this building does from time to time. If you're struggling with a lack of joy, ask another believer to pray with you about that. Jesus said, no one will take your joy from you, but all of us struggle to live in that. Our own sin, our disappointments, conflicts with others, worry over children, all of these things can sap our joy. One of the benefits of our community, the body of Christ, is that there are people all around you who are willing to stand with you in prayer. To pray for you when you're so sad you don't even feel like praying. To pray for you to experience the joy of the Lord. To pray with you about whatever situation or problem is weighing so heavily on your mind. Tell another believer about your struggle and ask them to pray with you and for you. So you can live in the joy of Christ. Final suggestion. Tell someone how your relationship with Jesus brings you joy. What is it about your walk with God that brings you joy? Think about that for just a second. For some of us, we never get over the wonder that Christ saved us. 
how undeserving, how unworthy, how wicked we were, and Christ saved us. He died to save us. For others, it may be knowing that you're loved and accepted no matter what your past looks like, no matter what your present looks like. You're loved and accepted on the basis of Christ. Whatever it is, tell someone about it this week. Share with them the joy that you experience. I almost said feel. You don't always feel it. Stop that, slave. Uh, share with them the joy that you know is yours in Christ. I'll get around to it in a second. <clears throat> Testify about the joy that the Lord has given to you. Worship team, you can uh, come back. You're not coming back. Prayer team, sorry. I knew one of the teams was going to come. Y'all can come forward. <laughs> sorry to musicians. I didn't mean to <laughs> throw you off there. If you would all stand, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you that you give us invincible joy. Lord, I don't always live in that joy. Day by day, throughout the day, very often, I'm in and out of experiencing joy. I, I feel doubt, I feel anger, I feel regret. And Lord, I know that there are some people in this building that have been struggling under a weight of sadness or depression or worry for years. And I pray today, Lord Jesus, that you would deliver them into your joy today. I pray, God, that even if they don't feel the joy, that you would move their hearts to rejoice in who you are and what you have done. And I do pray, Lord God, that you would bless them also with the feeling of joy. I pray that their emotions would be lifted when they meditate on who you are, when they meditate on how good you are. And Lord, I pray that if there are any in here that are thinking, I, I can't do that. I just can't do it. I hear this and I still can't do it. I pray, Lord, that you would drive them to reach out to another brother or sister in Christ. That someone else could put their arm around them and pray for them and pray with them and show them the love of Christ. Thank you again. For all that you are, Lord Jesus. Thank you again for loving us so deeply and constantly. I pray for your blessings of grace upon everyone that is here this morning. In your holy name, amen. God bless you all. You are